Om Shanti. When the mind frees itself from all negativity, then the mind naturally dances. And the most beautiful dance, the most gentle dance, is the dance of the mind. When the mind is free, it dances. And when the mind is dancing, it listens to the music of the truth. The mind can hear the melody of the truth. And the mind sees the beauty of the soul. And it takes strength from God. So when I put my mind into the depth of silence, that beautiful silence can clean the mind. Silence can take away all the noise, all the dust, and all the darkness of the soul. Because in silence the mind reconnects with its original purity. Silence. Pure silence. And silence filled with truth. The truth of the soul. Its natural state of being. Just a soul. And when the mind becomes silent, it can see beauty. It can see the beauty of itself, but also the beauty in others. the beauty in the world and the beauty of the source the supreme the divine the eternal truth And so connected with the deep silence of truth, the truth that doesn't need words to be spoken, but just the heart to be felt. So when the mind listens to the music of the truth, The movements of the mind reflect the beauty of the soul. Thoughts become filled with love, with peace, with kindness.
and the mind dances. And the thoughts follow the rhythm of beauty. And the more the mind anchors itself in truth and beauty, the more the mind can experience the strength of the Supreme. As if the mind is being pulled, drawn to the higher light, the higher being. the source of all powers. And the mind dances in front of the sun, sees the rays of light, feels the might, and it becomes bright. So the mind takes strength and power, it becomes strong, and that beauty filled with silence reveals the power of the soul, the power of love the power of peace, the power of its own purity. So the mind can continue to dance, even if the energy around the scenes around the soul become sometimes a little bit difficult or negative, the mind continues to dance. And the mind is strong. There is determination. There is the will, the courage and the soul. So I bring my mind back again and again into the depth of silence. I listen to silence. I let go of everything. I surrender to the purity of silence. And the beauty that I find, I can give it to others because I'm strong. I don't allow situations or people around me to shake me. And 
and so dances the mind. And the mind keeps dancing. This is the dance club, right? This is the dancing evening, is it? All right, we're at the right place. <laughs> Did you feel your mind was starting to dance a little bit? How is it bouncing against the walls? <laughs> Good to see you again. And um, so this is going to be the third session on the topic of the dancing mind, the dance of the mind. And if you like the topic and you want to listen to it again, it's on YouTube, so we can play with those ideas. And yeah, that's good. I like the idea that um, you know we started with mostly looking at the strength of the mind, and you know if you are with forty uh, degrees of fever in bed, sweating hallucinating and someone says hey do you want to come and dance you say oh, not really <laughs> you don't feel like dancing when you're sick is it so it takes a little strength a little energy to be able to go and dance and sometimes we're just not in the mood you know we just don't feel like going dancing at all and the reason often is that the mind or the person is just not in good time uh, good mood good shape so the first session was mostly about exercising the mind giving the mind a chance to you know, become a little bit stronger. So um, the focus was on the uh, paying attention to giving the mind exercise on a regular basis. And in the second part, we went more into, if I can recall properly, what uh, was in the meditation now is that the mind needs you know, an anchor. It has to really, just to become able to dance, it has to listen to the music. And the thought was that the music is that kind of purity, the truth, the knowledge, the information that the soul learns. And so we um, highlighted the necessity of learning, studying, bringing new, fresh food in the mind. If the mind eats the same food over and over and over and over, what are you going to, what's going to happen? If we rethink the same thought again and again, and particularly if it's a negative thought, the same worry every day, you know. Maybe I'll be late. Every morning you tell that to yourself. <laughs> You'll definitely be late. So what kind of thoughts we entertain? How do we learn to change the thoughts, to change the awareness, the consciousness? And studying is beautiful. It's really, really, if you really study well, then you really enjoy. If you find the teaching boring, then of course, what can we, we're not learning at the time. So we're mentioning that the that knowledge is really the melody of the dance, that the melody that makes the soul dance. But then with the melody, you need also values, qualities, skills, uh, abilities that um, allow you to dance properly, know how to be gracious. I mean, if you dance and you break everything around whilst dancing, it's not really, it's fun, but... Uh, not sure the parents or the neighbors will like it. And if when dancing you just hit everybody around because you are moving all the time, and then at the end of your dance you have three people on the floor bleeding and it says, yeah, <laughs> that was a little bit intense dancing, right? It's not the kind of dance you want to do just by pushing everybody and creating chaos. So beauty in the dance is nice, and graciousness and elegance and art the beauty of seeing a dancer when they perform is you look at them and say, wow, how can they do that? Of course, they have years of training, but like professional dancers, they are incredible. You, every little movement is calculated. So in the ability to keep the mind dancing, then it comes from the ability to bring in the mind the beauty of values, virtues, love, peace, happiness, kindness, all these qualities, 
So not only we learn, but then we have to absorb, we have to develop those qualities. And then the third part was the idea of uh, the strength, the endurance, the so that it's not just a little dance, you dance for five minutes, and then you go crazy for three days, you know, and you say, oh, I had a good dance, mentally, and then next three days you just go crazy. Then what's the point? Uh, the dance has to keep going all the time, all the time, all the time. And if something happens, then you say, okay, am I stopping to dance, or I, do I keep dancing? So the dance keeps going only when there's power in the soul, strength and we call it the power of yoga. So knowledge, virtues, yoga, they give a complete set of uh, resource and sustenance to the soul. So I think that's what we were playing with for the past two sessions. And where I'd like to take your mind to now is a phase which is quite important because most people don't really dance alone, right? Sometimes it's good to dance alone, but sometimes you want someone else to dance with. And uh, that becomes a little bit tricky. Because if you want to dance rock and roll, but your partner wants to dance the slow, well, <laughs> you have to compromise or choose one or the other or change partner or change the dance. I mean, it's not going to work very well, isn't it? And <clears throat> in life, the truth is that we are most of the time involved in connecting with other people. Even if it's not physically, sometimes it's just mentally. And even when we're alone, most of the time in our head, there are a lot of other people there. And I know we create those kind of uh, exercise in the early uh, stage of um, the Raj Yoga course. But sometimes we ask people, can you identify how many people you thought about during the day? I mean, that would take you a little effort, but if you were to pay attention over the next few days, for example, to just see how many people enter your mind with or without your authorization. Can you imagine people walking in your home without asking? You know, you're just having a nice nap and then three people show up. Hi there, you know, we just decided to come for tea. So what? I didn't ask you. I mean, I love you, but I didn't ask you to come. Uh, imagine your mind being invaded by other people without you wanting them to be there in the first place. And so when we have a conflict, uh, conflicting situation, what happens? Let's say you had an argument with someone, so it doesn't go well and you're not happy and you don't agree and oh, yeah, you don't feel happy. Normally when you leave the person, you should be really happy to leave the person. Say, Om Shanti, bye-bye. Have nice chapatis or something, but leave me alone. And then you go home, and what happens? They're all in your mind. <laughs> and they all sneaked in, and you keep talking to them the whole evening. They're not there physically, but they just moved into your mind. <laughs> and this is really annoying. And the conversation keeps going. The arguments get, and you rewind, you start again. You rewind, you sit better. No, what I really meant, you rewind, now you do it really well. <laughs> We become experts trying to sort out something in our head because of our negativity, anger or you know frustration, whatever. So we haven't freed the mind from the other person, even if they're not there physically. At that time, I think we cannot say the mind is dancing. It's bouncing against the wall, you know, head first. And it's like, a, imagine a little um, uh, the toy which is a little bit broken, and instead of nicely moving, it it's, it's a wall all the time, and then, so, oh, the toy is broken, it's not what it's supposed to do. So the mind should be dancing, but instead, it's really caught into some kind of uh, negativity. And the uh, the majority of our time, we are challenged by other people. And what we say in meditation is that, to keep the mind dancing, you have actually to harmonize your sanskaras, your personality traits. So sanskara is a word we use to describe uh, the imprint of the action on the soul. So every time the soul or every time the person performs an action, 
that action leaves a little mark on the soul. If you do something really nice, if you go and see your grandma and you bring her beautiful flowers and you spend the whole evening with her and you're very patient because she doesn't even recognize you, uh, well, that's good action, you know, you, you're courageous. <laughs> if she is recognizing you and giving you money and uh, food and everything, I don't know who is giving more to the other, but if she's <laughs> not well, doesn't even recognize you, and you still go, sacrifice a whole evening, spend time, give her love, take care of her, how would you feel afterwards? And what is the little uh, trace left on the soul after that? On the opposite, and if you meet uh, a child who is misbehaving and you hit the child because you're angry and you jar around, how would you feel afterwards? It will bite your consciousness. That's what they say, right? Your, your conscience bites. You know there's something wrong. You feel guilty. You feel ashamed. You feel embarrassed. You feel bad about what you have done. So actions leave a mark on the self. And those marks, they're not just innocent. They grow in the soul. They continue to grow. So what is being done to me and what I do to others becomes what we call a sanskara. Sanskara means that thing is from you know, the self and karma. So what is the karma doing on the self? And they become my personality, basically. And what we say is that the fundamental identity of the soul, it's its personality, what the personality has become. And if for a reason or another, I develop negative tendencies, negative habits, they are becoming my personality. Someone who is always um, arguing, always complaining, always criticizing, it becomes a little bit much, right? then always blaming, <laughs> then always, you know, whatever. At some point, these negative traits are part of the personality. Others will say, oh, he's always complaining. He's always negative. You know, he's never happy. There's always something wrong. You know, he's right, everybody else is wrong, isn't it? And those kind of personalities, I don't know, they're not very attractive, usually. They, they tend to create a little bit of confusion and People are annoyed and they say, oh, he's, he's doing it again, you know. And some become, from that, they become even a little bit aggressive, arrogant. They start raising the tone. They start acting a little bit weird, you know, threatening. And we can go on like this. Uh, others are so shy that you always look for them where they disappear, you know. They're under the rug and under the carpet, under the bed. They're so shy, they're so unwell with themselves. They don't want to be seen by others. I'm taking a little bit extreme personality. But they are personality traits. The soul actually is not like that. But it has become like that because of patterns. Education, bad events that happen in life. And we've seen it. We've seen people, good young babies, that had all the potential to become great people. But they go through traumatic, traumatic moments. And what they become afterwards, you know, could be good or bad. I don't know. You don't know. And some go really bad. And one day something happened to them and they change. And they realize, oh, well, that's not what I want. I want to change. And they become, you know, wonderful people teaching others how not to perform negativity. So this is personality traits, the sanskaras, the habits, tendencies of the soul. And where I'm bringing this is because when we dance, actually what we really have to do with the mind is find ways to harmonize my sanskaras with the sanskaras of somebody else. And the only way to do it is if the mind becomes a little bit like the oil between two pieces that are really not met, not really meant to be together properly. So if you have a square and a triangle and you try to fit them together, they don't fit together. 
but it, I don't know, I haven't tried, but if you use a lot of oil, <laughs> maybe you can cheat it a little bit and they can at least, you know, it will be less hurtful that if you're trying to make them fit together. And so what we find is that it's very rare to meet people with similar sanskaras. We are looking for them. You want people who have same patterns as you do. Much easier, isn't it? But the reality is we're also attracted by people who have better sanskaras than us or different sanskaras than us because we find them quite attractive. We like somebody different than us, isn't it? Uh, if you're not courageous but you meet someone very courageous, you know, I like that. I'm attracted. So we don't really uh, spend a lot of time with people who are exactly like us. And if you get married or if you get in relationship with someone who has 80% of their sanskaras to be the same as yours, well, that makes life a little bit easier. But what happens is that one day the 20% which is different start to spoil the relationship. And instead of seeing the 80% of our working well, we start focusing on the 20% who don't work well, isn't it? And that's where we break relationships. Yet, at the beginning, you would say, well, you had 80% 80 per, 80, uh, percent chances of, succe of su uh, success because, yeah, it's a good match. But 20% at some point becomes a little bit tricky. And then you really want the other person to change their 20% so it doesn't bother you anymore. <laughs> Isn't it? And that becomes like, a, and that's not a dance, that's called fighting. And so from dancing with nice little ballerina shoes, you pull out the boxing gloves and say, come on, I have a new dance for you. <laughs> and that doesn't really, I mean, boxing is good, but I don't like it particularly, but some people watch it and they like it. I don't particularly enjoy seeing people being punched and bleeding, and that's not my thing. So, dancing or boxing? You know, better dancing, right? <laughs> so the dance, uh, what we teach in Rajuka, is my ability to adjust with someone else's sanskaras without trying to change them. If another person is dancing with a lot of very heavy movement, well, just step back a little bit. Don't tell him, hey, this is my spot, I want to dance there. You're going to be hurt. And we just need to step back and you start to reproduce the same movement and then maybe you can calm him down a little bit. So the um, ability to adjust to other people's samskaras. And for that, why is it that the mind is useful? Because the mind will be thinking according to what is happening. If someone is shouting, you will think, well, why are you shouting? Stay quiet. But sometimes, you might have to just think, well, this is his role to be shouting. And, and, and unless it's really bad, and uh, you can do something, but sometimes just let him shout and keep going and do something else. It's his role. It's not my role. Uh, if people want to hurt themselves, sometimes, honestly, it would be like, well, I can't control everyone. I can't change everybody. I cannot fix everything. And sometimes there's a slogan saying, I didn't create it, and I can't fix it. So it's not that, you know, I was responsible for everything that happens. So other people's personalities, most likely, you won't have a um, big, big effect on it. A little bit, but they will remain who they are. Their own journey, that's their own journey, that will allow them to change or not. It's not me who can change somebody. What I can do is to learn to accept the differences. It's to find my own way to step around so I don't get hurt by the person. Uh, the image we always give is this beautiful image of the river. And if you follow a river from the source all the way to the ocean, it goes through so many different phases. You know, it might even become a lake at some point. So it's almost like it's... Uh, beautiful lake, but it's actually a current coming in from one end and come, come continuing on the other end. And then it goes through rapids. And they say when water hits the rock, 
it's not trying to move the rock. It naturally goes around. It doesn't it's not bothered by a rock, isn't it? But if rocks hits rocks, <laughs> they move each other. And uh, water doesn't uh, move the rock; it just goes around. And with time, the rocks become the rock becomes even very soft, very nice. It's been polished by water. And so the dance of the mind is when it becomes water, not rock. And if there is differences, I accept them. If someone else, uh, if someone has a different personality, different habits, I may have to. May, maybe not accepting them because sometimes it's not a question of accepting it's a question of tolerating which is different and other times it's just a matter of um, being very detached so it's not a matter of accepting or tolerating it's just a matter of being very very detached so tolerating means you are confronting it a little bit you're close to it and you tolerate accepting it is when you see it but being detached is when you don't get too close anymore. You just don't make yourself uh, affected by the person or the situation. So that's called detachment. So the dance of the mind requires at some point that we learn how to adjust and um, move around the personality of people who are very different from us. And the real trick to keep the mind dancing is its ability to connect with other people properly because life is a big chunk of our life is how we move through the relationships child and parent you know husband and wife brother and sisters relationships friends work the world see we see people in a society killing each other how do we cope with that how do we feel if uh, you know, a neighbor starts misbehaving and break the whole thing. It's a family. I mean, world is a big family. And our mind is in reaction to everything that happens. And so what creates the sorrow of the mind uh, is its own way of thinking about what's happening, isn't it? If something is wrong and you start to think, oh, it's so wrong and it shouldn't be like this, it should have never been like that, why is it like this? You're producing sorrow for the mind, isn't it? But if something is wrong and you say, yes, it is wrong, but it is right as well because it's happening. And if it's happening, there's a reason. Can I change it? No, then I don't need to think about it. If I can have a positive effect, yes, by all means, if somebody is misbehaving and I can talk to the person, convince the person to do otherwise, fine, of course, we have to do it. But at that time, the mind is positive. It will say, let me try to help, let me try to calm down the person, let me try to show something different, let me try to give love to that person so that person may change. That's the, the mind is still dancing. It's trying to do a line dancing at that time. You know, it's just trying to move the movement and say, just follow me, you know, just do that. And we try to create line dancing. Is that how you call it? Line dancing? Yeah, it just, uh, it's this beautiful dance. If everybody, everybody follows. If we live in a family, that's what parents should try, to keep everyone dancing on the same rhythm. So the mind can dance but uh, it needs that really powerful skill uh, how to dance in a zone of conflict you know how do you keep dancing when everybody else is fighting you know, just show up in a big boxing game and then you show up on the ring hello <laughs> so say, what is she doing this is kind of uh, people are fighting and you're dancing um, we took up and uh, at the center here since uh, early part of the week um, just just a thought that uh, we read something that talked about constant happiness and so the thought came can it really happen that happiness remains con constant what do you think yeah, yeah. can we stay constantly hap uh, happy so we a uh, few of us decided to um, imagine a marathon of happiness <laughs> and the thought is that we I just told them, okay, maybe we can try at some point. And they said, no, let's try now. So right there we start to say, okay, we're all 
in a pretty happy mood. Let's see how long we can stay in that happy mood. And to be honest, I really, really enjoy that uh, trick because at the moment you really take it a little bit seriously and you say, okay, okay, I'm going to be happy. And the first one who loses the happiness, you're out. You know, you, you, you lost the marathon. You have to be honest and step down. And at the end of the week, you will have to say, sorry, on Tuesday, I crashed. And I think for me anyway, I don't know if we said it publicly, but for me, I thought I can only allow myself less than an hour to sort out something. If there's a little fluctuation, it's, if it passes an hour, then I'm out. So, so far it hasn't gone more than an hour. But what I've noticed is that the moment you decide to be constantly happy, you become very aware of the influence of tiny little things. Mm -hmm. And I feel I've been bombarded since it was like a challenging the universe to say, okay, I'm going to be constantly happy. And all the evils of the world and the monsters as you think so, let us show you something. And they all like, uh, you know, came together trying to break my happiness. And there was small, bigger things, all kind of things. But it became quite interesting to check over the whole week. Um, so those who go on computers sometimes, if you want to test the speed of your computer, you have little uh, application that do that. And you see the needle, you know, and it it shows you like you're getting hired, uh, upload or download, and then, you know, and you want to have a high circulation of energy in your computer. So since the beginning of the week, I feel I have my soul has turned into a little needle that is always uh, do, no, 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 keep going, keep going. <laughs> you know, you don't want. And I was thinking you don't want to go under eighty percent. So I thought out of ten, you know, it's like between. Eight and ten is good, but it shouldn't go under eight because then, then it wouldn't be called constant happiness. And so far, I think I mean I, it could be better, but um, I'm pretty uh, fascinated with the ability and how much effort it takes to keep the soul happy. Because if you don't do something, ooh, it can go down a little bit like this because you start thinking, oh, this didn't work, or. Oh, and uh, those who know me, I go for tennis lessons, and I'm quite fanatical about tennis. I love it. You know, I really think it's good, and it helps my mind also to be healthy. And the other the morning, I had to go for a tennis lessons. So I was kind of looking forward to it, but I was a bit tired. I show up there, and I pull my racket. I totally forgot that I broke it the time before. So I pull on my racket. Oh, gee, the strings are totally broken. So... Thankfully, the teacher had a few rackets, so he gave me one, but very different. And his racket, and it's not just the racket, it was really me plus the racket, turned the ball into, I don't know, it was just like wild fireworks, you know, like uh, they were not touching the ground. I don't know what was wrong with those balls, but they were going everywhere. He was telling me, send your ball there, and I was trying, it was totally the other ball, and I thought, oh, gosh. And then I said, no, Eric, happy. Yeah, I can be happy when you miss all the shots, you know? <laughs> and if you're really into it, it was tricky, and I keep thinking, Eric, you have one hour. You know, this is an hour lesson, but it's not. Don't go down for an hour. So I was trying to be happy, feeling the deep frustration of not performing well at all, being tired. And he was cruel with me, the teacher. He kept me running and running and running. I was out of breath, and I was trying to be happy. Try to be happy, and I realized you're artificially happy. This is not true happiness. You're cheating here. And uh, so it took, and the question I raised at some point was, do we have to make effort to be happy? Or is happiness the result of our efforts? And at that point I was remembering that my effort should not be to boost happiness. My effort is to be detached, is to let go, it's to be okay, is to be easy, uh, is to drop expectations. So I realized that the non-happiness was not about the performance, the non-happiness was about all the other elements underneath. I was expecting, I, was, I wanted things to be this way, but it turned out that way. So during the week, there was a lot of little, little things like this that happened uh, completely contrary to, and certain things that happened which never happened. And I thought, why I did this yesterday? What this happened? And I realized, okay, this is again my test to see if happiness can be, uh, can be more constant. And I invite you to try to really tell yourself, okay, from now on, you try to stay happy. And it's not that kind of um, 
I don't know if you've tried uh, Isabel, yeah? But she's naturally happy, I don't know. You, you have no effort to make, right? <laughs> I do. I can become grumpy, so <laughs> those who are never grumpy, I don't have to make effort. That uh, was, was good? Yeah, it was good. Good. Thank Lord you were happy anyway. So <laughs> you forgot, but you were happy anyway. <laughs> Good. You didn't lose. You're still running in a marathon. <laughs> but it's a beautiful concept, the marathon of happiness. You know, that uh, if you lose your happiness, you're out. <laughs> then you're on the side and you look miserable. And what happened? I stopped being happy. Oh, poor you. <laughs> Lost the, the marathon of happiness. <clears throat> So that dance of the mind really ultimately has um, to perform or to be performed when we're connecting with other people. And it's good to question ourselves and see when do we lose our happiness? When do we lose our lightness that keeps the mind dancing? And the dance of the mind is a mind that is easy, right? Uh, dancing of the mind is just a figure or image to show that um, the mind is not dancing like real, the body is dancing. But the mind is easy, light, uh, not stuck on anything. The mind feels that there's no um, problem, you know, it's just like, it's okay, it feels okay. That means it's dancing. And really there's no negativity at the time in the mind. But negativity comes, right? You get a little bit impatient, angry, worried, uh, just down sometimes, moody. And those little you know, shifts of mood or emotions affect the mind. And that's when the mind stops having that feeling of lightness. So it's kind of interesting to, to, to look at that and pay attention. And when we look at the ability to accept other people, um, how much do we really accept? the difference. Uh, can we even like the difference? Or not really? <laughs> How far does it go? You know, accepting, tolerating, being detached. And if we practice uh, this little move, you know, it helps. Because one, when the relationship becomes a little bit difficult, you just apply that and you will find that the only reason why you don't accept because you expect that's the only problem if we don't expect then you can accept that's usually that's the rule and um, why we don't tolerate why we would not tolerate someone it's just because at that time uh, we feel that we know best that the other person it's just that we're attached to our own ideas to our own thinking, then we don't tolerate the other person. Uh, if the other person is pleasing me, I tolerate easily. But so, acceptance is one thing, but then tolerating is quite different. Uh, and to tolerate, we have to renounce a little bit uh, to our own ego. It has to be dropped a little bit, then we can tolerate. If you are humble, it's easy to tolerate. If you're arrogant, it's very difficult to tolerate. And then to detach, uh, well, then we need to be filled with something else. Why do we attach ourselves? Because we're empty. And we're just desperate. We're just connecting, attaching, as if we're going to really get something out of it. So we're just uh, grasping it. When we don't want to let go, is because we're scared that we'll be missing it. Detachment tells you you're not going to miss anything. But you detach if you feel that you have a certain form of fulfillment, certain form of trust that you have everything you need inside. You don't need an, another person. You don't need anything. The soul has everything it needs. Then the rest is just game. It's just entertainment. It's just we came here to have fun, really. I mean, those who are on earth and were not having fun, they are missing the whole movie. <laughs> they are not getting it. We came on earth to enjoy. The purpose of being here is to experience, to enjoy, to, 
to have pleasure in in life but why do we sometimes get told so so sad or so suffer so much because of what we go through that's because we got entangled we made our own little web and we're stuck in it so the beauty of what we do in spirituality is to find a way to remove that and say to the soul be free so detaching is um, it's not easy to be detached uh, particularly to be detached from those we love because those you love you are very attached to <clears throat> but we say to love or to to like or dislike is the same kind of attachment if you are detached you'll still love but you won't have any dislike feel any feelings of disliking it doesn't work the same way only when we're attached then we're very affected by the other person and so then we get into possessive love and disliking the other person uh, even the people we love we start disliking them at the moment they're doing something we don't like who hasn't been uh, annoyed with their children or their husband or wife or mother or parents you know we love them but sometimes and particularly those people tend to push your buttons and before you know you just go crazy and say I love you but I hate you <laughs> so you say well what do you pick up the right one or do you love me or do you hate me well I said, at that time I hate you but in general I love you isn't it and that's because of attachment so these are the three uh, steps we would learn in dancing accepting tolerating and being detached and we find that when those three steps are there if you really accept other people with their differences if you really tolerate and if you get quite detached it's easy to um, start to appreciate other people for who they are and whatever they are uh, we start appreciating them we start to feel that we can have a better influence on them because we're not judging them we're not reacting to them we're being ourselves and we're presenting to them the best part of ourselves if you present your anger and your frustration and your ego other people are not benefiting a lot from it they will be hurt by it but they won't benefit much they might just say afterwards oh you get angry at me and whatever you told me oh it helps me now I'm moving forward okay this is called very bitter medicine and it's like the better medicine but you take bitter medicine and we say don't take the bitter one take the better one which is sweet and kindness and love this is better the other one is bitter and it's not necessary so once we are a little bit more detached a little bit more tolerant a little bit more accepting then we can be definitely more loving more you know uh, because we remain strong in front of the other if you're reacting in front of another you are showing your weakness you're not showing your strength uh, you know if there is an earthquake or something and you start becoming hysterical and screaming and okay people would say it's normal but it doesn't help anybody and the heroes will be those who are yeah they're scared to death this is you know death is all around but they show their strength they show courage they get they have to be detached they'll see people missing an arm bleeding they shouldn't faint I mean if you faint when you see that what can you do nothing so being detached and I'm just getting dramatic here right so let's <laughs> I see the example is growing earthquake arms moving around well okay okay it's fine <laughs> this is a strange dance you know this is a heavy duty dance the dance of the earthquake <laughs> But the analogy, I mean, is the point is, if I'm not detached, I don't show my strength. I show my weakness. Okay, so that was the final move to keep dancing. Does it make sense to you? Or, yeah, because we don't dance alone. So, odd couples are very nice. You know, when they don't match, the size is not the right one. They don't really dance the same dance, but somehow they look beautiful. Why? Because you know they're adjusting. And I'll leave you with that image again uh, of um, playing tennis, and 
I was with a partner and we were on our court trying to play very well you know, and we're hitting the balls and well, it was fun. I'm, I was enjoying it. It was quite a lot of fun. But my partner was very, <clears throat> very, uh, how to say, um, competitive and, you know, and then every time he'll miss a ball, I thought he will hit his racket somewhere. And I'm thinking, well, don't get so mad. I mean, you're just playing. This is not like Grand Slam in Wimbledon, you know. This is just Jari Park and we had nobody here. But next to it, and we had, you know, proper, and what I really noticed, we both had very nice outfit, you know, to play, like proper shorts and T-shirts shining and, you know, big bags for the tennis racket. So we look like professional who just play very badly. Uh, but seriously. <laughs> and next to us, there were, I presume, a couple, or I don't know, friends, I don't know. But uh, they were in uh, running shoes, uh, pretty ordinary, not at all uh, uh, adapted for tennis. They were dressed like completely, uh, you know, whatever shorts they find. I don't know if it's a swimming suit or a short, but they look pretty casual, you know, for people on the tennis court. And their tennis looked much more like badminton, I found. That was more like, they looked more like playing like this than really like that. And their balls were always on our court or somewhere else. They were always searching for their balls somewhere. And they were just going everywhere. They were missing all the balls. But they were laughing, having so much fun. They were like crammed, you know, they were. And then even my partners are making, oh, they're making noise, these people. And then at some point it struck me, you know, that, hey, you know, we're suffering here and they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> we play okay. They don't play well at all, but they're having more fun. <laughs> and I realized, what are we doing? You know, like, and we're paying for suffering. It's not the point, you know, <laughs> like they pay the same amount and they have way more fun than we do. So I told my partner, I said, don't you think we should have a bit more fun like they do? And he's like, you know? <laughs> it's not spiritual very much. But to me, it stayed in my head that, you know, just relax. It's just a game. It's just a sport. And don't get into your head in you know, such a way that you, you go crazy with it. So I think life is like that. And I think they were like a couple, like dancing together, if you want. They didn't match. They were playing very badly. But they had fun. And I think that if we see that image, that you may be with someone that is not like you, don't think like you, don't do things the same as you do. But what's the point? Let's have fun. You know, let's accept the difference. Let's be detached and enjoy. So it works that way. So now, shall we dance or go and play tennis? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. I'll do that. So let's finish with maybe a nice meditation again. Did you follow the first meditation? Um, so the concept will be, again, I can share some thoughts, but really you listen to it and you can stop listening to it. It's fine. But the, important is, the importance is for you to just pay attention to the flow of the thoughts and creating the experience with the thoughts. So if I say a few words, you may listen to them, but then in between... You can tr create your own thinking, add your own little flavor, and that's we'll dance together in that way. No, it's on its own. It's already dancing. sit very quietly and we give the body beautiful waves of peace and rest breathing deeply and we enjoy when the air goes through the body And you feel that your body is completely relaxed. And the body is quiet. And even if we are keeping our eyes slightly open, we can slowly detach from everything around us. We can see, but we don't see. We 
can hear but we don't listen. All the noise around, it's there. We are starting to feel a beautiful and very fresh feeling in the center of the forehead, just above the eyes, the seat of the soul. This is where I am. This is where my thoughts come from. And I see myself as a soul. It's a beautiful feeling. As if there is a gentle light. A point of light. It's the light of the awareness the light of the consciousness. This is the soul. And I really enjoy being aware of the soul. And at the same time aware of the body. But I keep in mind that I'm a soul in the body and that I, the soul, I'm the one thinking. And it is I, the soul, living my life in my physical body. And I know that I play my role in my life. I am who I am. But I also know that the soul needs purity, peace, love on a spiritual level to be able to expand and to play my role in the world with everyone around me I need to find a time to fill myself With that spirituality, the spirituality of the soul. And if I can, for a few moments, absorb in myself the energy of peace. the energy of love. I know that I will have that peace and love with me when it's time to perform, when it's time to play my role. So I really appreciate the moment I'm taking to dive deep into the qualities of the soul. And I let my mind dance the dance of the soul. 
tell myself that I am a beautiful soul, that I am a powerful soul. I see in myself the purity of the soul. And I can feel that I can be also a very peaceful soul. Just comfortable in my peace. Natural. Easy. And I feel that peace is such a beautiful state of mind. A peaceful mind. How wonderful it is just to think in peace. And I can notice how my thoughts have become slower, deeper, filled with peace. as I enjoy that experience of peace I know that I will have to come back to the human dance when I will have to be with so many other people around me But I will not lose my ps I will see everyone as a unique actor in this beautiful drama. And whatever dance and role they're playing, I will stay with my own peace. And when I think of it, I'm never really dancing alone. I know that the divine is always pulled by the dance of peace. And when I'm connected with my beauty, I know he's watching. I know he's there, just a thought away. Always giving me his hand so I can join and dance. I'm never really alone. So I dance with the Supreme, light with light, peace in the ocean of peace, love in the ocean of love.
Okay. <clears throat> so you can say to people you'll meet tonight, you went to a dance club. There's a very different one. <laughs> and we dance without moving. It all happened in the mind. Okay. I wish you a good night, good week, good weekend. See you very soon. And Om Shanti. Hmm.